Hey everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm really excited to have with me author Robert Duncan. Robert will give us the inside scoop on his new book, Loudmouth, as well as the book he published in the 1970s about Kiss. Robert was also the managing editor of Cream Magazine, as well as a rock journalist in the 70s, and he'll give us the insights on what it was like to work in Cream, Rolling Stone, Circus Magazine, and countless others during the 70s. I think you guys are going to really enjoy hearing his stories. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. Now, without further ado, let's get started with my conversation with author Robert Duncan. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn. Today I'm really excited to have with me author, managing editor from Cream Magazine. Please welcome Robert Duncan. How are you doing? Good, Mike. Thanks for having me. It's uh, fun to be here. I'm excited to have you on. And, you know, I wanted to start right away with the fact that you have a new book coming out. I think it's October 6th, if I'm not mistaken, called Loudmouth. We can see it right over your shoulder. So it's a rock and roll (laughs) novel. What made you decide at this point to dabble in a rock and roll book, a rock and roll novel, Loudmouth? Well, it's it's funny. Well, I I didn't really decide. I started at a certain point, mm-hmm. like six years ago, writing down stories. Okay. Um, I mean, I've been a, I've written a bunch of nonfiction books. Sure. But I, I've been writing. I just started this. I had this thing where I just started writing like crazy, and I'm like, what am I writing? I don't know. I'll just so I was writing every day, day and night, mm-hmm. and um. And I thought, and, and at my job where I would get irritated when somebody would come in and ask me to do something, I'd be like, oh, God damn it, I'm working on the book. <laughs> I, well, I didn't know it was a book. I thought it was a bunch of stories. And it, and it, at the, after about 13 months of writing, I put all these these stories down on the ground and I thought, you know what, this this is kind of like a memoir. Mm-hmm. But if I, you know, if I took this out and took this out and I added this and that, it would be like a memoir. Well, I couldn't write a memoir because it would be because I'd have to have all the boring parts in. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's just make it a novel. It's definitely based on my life, mm-hmm. um, but it also lets me shield the people who are still alive, who <laughs> you know, who might not like how I characterize them. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd always wanted to write a novel when I when I was uh, I started out as a singer in rock bands, and after mm-hmm. that, I when I decided forget bands. Uh, I will go and be a, uh, I'll go be a writer. And I knew about music. So I thought I'll be, I'll try to be a rock critic, mm-hmm. but I always, always from when I was, you know, in my early twenties was thinking, uh, boy, I got to write a novel someday. Cause that's, that's the legit thing that writers do. <laughs> so I wrote a novel that's very much, uh, based on my own story. So it, it ain't science fiction. Mm-hmm. In fact, the most outrageous parts of it are probably, People will say, well, just tell me, is that part true? Yeah. And and I'm like, well, yeah. The, I said, if it's outrageous, it's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> One of the quotes I've seen from you is you said something along the lines of, a lot of it is fact, but all of it's the truth, right? So yeah. <laughs> that is that is the truth. <laughs> that is the truth. So, I mean, you know, I, I, at one point I was writing, oh, yeah, then I moved here and I moved there. And it, it was like, nobody wants to. Re- I don't want to read that. Right. right I don't right. want to write that. So I'm going to leave out all that that you know i'm going to leave out some of the facts because mm-hmm. they're boring mm-hmm. yeah okay so the the main character in the book is a, a person called thomas ransom right so could That's you just great. talk a little bit about the character what's the character like like you just said it's a little bit based off a lot of it based off of you i guess yeah yeah well thomas is a uh, a guy who was uh raised in a, a very kind of uh uh tough um southern family my my family was all from the south and mm-hmm. and you know they were just hardcore southerners but they raised us in the north mm-hmm. including probably most of our childhood in new york okay. uh and it was like okay well this this ain't working you're you know they were they were you know they 
it wasn't the most pleasant family to to grow up in. Mm-hmm. So he has the same experience, and he guy like me, he went to Catholic school, and he decides to to you know get away from it all by becoming. I mean, he he was in a rock and roll obsessive, mm-hmm. and he decides, all right, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna become, I'm gonna learn to play guitar and be a singer in a band and all that, and uh, and he does, and mm-hmm. he's uh, he does, I did. Uh, became kind of had a level of, you know, climbing the ladder success and got to be a good singer in a good band. And then every time the band would get to, you know, we finally got an agent and we got a tour. Mm -hmm. And again, this stuff's in the book. Uh, And, you know, the the drummer would quit or the the guitar player would get in a fight with somebody and quit. Mm -hmm. And and so I was like, man, I got to do something that doesn't me, not the character, mm-hmm. but he thought he thought the same thing. So mm-hmm. I'm just gonna I'm gonna mix the two here. And, you know, but, to, uh, to that point, I noticed in the writing of the book, you you refer to the character as me and I. So as right, I'm reading right. it, in my mind, I kind of mix the two together as well. To be honest with you, yeah, yeah. Well, it it to me, it's like who cares? You yeah. know, uh, you know, Jack Kerouac wrote on the road as as I and me and mm-hmm. and and. And everybody knows, well, it was Neil Cassidy was his driver and, mm-hmm. and you know, he, he's this guy. And I thought, well, people will figure it out. Mm-hmm. But uh, but, yeah, I decided to do something as the Thomas does in the book that is doesn't depend on four other uh, people to uh, to play instruments. And that's when I thought, well, you know, I, I could do a, I could be a writer. Mm-hmm. Right. I, mean, I was always a good writer. Uh, it was one thing I was good at in school. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. Now you mentioned that you know the character comes from a dysfunctional family. Is that what you yeah. felt like growing up as a kid? Also, that like, is there a correlation between that for the character and yourself? Oh yeah, oh absolutely. As I said, yeah, mm-hmm. um, uh, it was. We had a crazy family, and I remember, I remember, um, I remember when I was about eighteen. I said to my best friend, I said, "Damn, you know, my mother was doing something just." terrible Mm -hmm. and uh and she did a lot of that and uh and uh, he says well everybody knows your mother's crazy i said (laughs) i said you wait till we're 18 to tell me everybody knows she's crazy because i thought it was me (laughs) so oh yeah and there was there was some there's some there's a a, a ugly scene or two in the book Mm -hmm. uh you know with the family scene so Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm How how would you say the character, though, is different from yourself, right? So you're basing it off yours, but your life. But how would you say the character is different? Different from (laughs) that's a really good question. Well, he's not much different. I mean, he's he's probably cooler. And uh, I think he's I think he gets to uh, he he, he's maybe he's cooler. Okay, okay, And And at his peak. At his peak, right? So, and his band in the in the book is Romper Room, right? If I'm not mistaken, yeah. Right. So, how does that how does that compare to the bands you were in growing up? Well, I had a band for a long time when we were growing up called Sky King, which was also named after a TV show. Romper okay. Room was a mm-hmm. kids yeah, it was kids yeah. TV show, mm-hmm. and there was a uh, and there was a a uh, there was another show. It was kind of a the I don't know. It was it was uh, before your time. But it was called Sky King, and it was about a guy who was kind of like a sheriff, but he had an he had an airplane, mm-hmm. and he had kind of a cute daughter named Penny, and so we just tongue in cheek we we named our band Sky King. So when okay. I was in Sky Sky King was we were, and I called myself Penny. Okay. So because uh, <laughs> we this was around the time of you know Alice Cooper and and the kind of gl- the glam era was sure. emerging. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we were right in the glam era, just before punk. Right. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, and our band too got to have a tour and got to have an agent and this mm-hmm. and that. Right. Right. Now I know that you put out a book in 1984, um, the noise. Um, what is it? Notes from Rock and Roll right. Era. Right. And I've seen you right. say that that was a painful experience. Right. In that book. Right. How oh did my that? God, how awesome. did that experience compare to this one? Uh. They're, don't ever write a book. They're all so <laughs> painful. It's just, I mean, that book took me three years to do, uh-huh. and this book took me five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 it's just like uh, every writer goes through it. When you're when you're going along, you're like, 
oh, this really sucks what I'm writing. <laughs> you read what you wrote today, and mm-hmm. it's like, this sucks. Mm-hmm. So uh, <clears throat> it doesn't always, right, but right. a lot of times it does. Right. So, you know, it, yes, it was a painful experience. Um, in Back in the back when I wrote The Noise in 84, mm-hmm. I had no other job but being a writer. Right. And so I had no way of making money. So I, I and I had this book contract. So I couldn't even go flip burgers at McDonald's because <laughs> right. I would I was going to get like seven grand, which was a lo- the, the other half of the advance mm-hmm. if I finished the book. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I got to finish the damn book. Eventually, the editor came and, and took it away from me. He called me up. I'm coming down there. I'm going to take your manuscript. Uh-huh. And fortunately, I wasn't lying. I actually had, you know, mostly written the book. So. Right, 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 right. That's so but, funny. Yeah, it was really painful. And, and then you get so, so embarrassed as it's about to come out. I'm in that stage now uh, with this book where it's like, oh, my God, everybody's going to see what an idiot I am. <laughs> <laughs> I found it entertaining, to be honest with you. There's nothing to me. You know, it, it was a good, quick read. It was a fun read, too, of the book. So I don't think people are going to feel like that. Oh, good. Well, I'm always I'm, that that's. That's great. Although when people say nice things to me about it, as some people have, like uh, Craig Finn from the Whole Steady, Hold Steady gave me a great blurb, mm-hmm. and he says, "No, I'm I'm not kidding. I really liked it." And mm-hmm. and so I just assume he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... if you say something good to me, it's like, oh, I appreciate that your your politeness, but mm-hmm. I just assume you're, well, you're bullshit. Well, you know what? I say this to all my guests. I don't say anything that I don't really mean. So if I didn't mean it, it would just be easy to just not say a word and just continue well, to plug the There's always a first time, book. Mike. Uh, there's, <laughs> well, well, this ain't it. How about that, Rob? <laughs> this isn't Well, it. thank you very much. I'll try to be gracious. Yeah. And you know, as you're talking about it and you're saying like how the previous publisher came to and just like, that was it. Time to take the book away. You reminded yeah. me of a conversation I had recently with Brad Gillis from Night Ranger. And he had a yeah. similar thing about writing music. And he was saying, you never really finish it. You just ultimately, quote unquote, abandon it. And you say, that's it. I have to be done. So it sounds like that's it's a it, similar yeah. process for a musician compared to an author here. Absolutely. And I, I write songs, too. So, But mm-hmm. the thing about songs is, you know, it's three minutes. Right. <laughs> I mean, this, this book is, uh, you know, if you read it straight, it's about 10 hours. I've been working on the, on the audio book, which is another thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll warn you, don't do the don't do an audio book <laughs> ever, especially when you decide, well, I know my way around a studio. I'm going to uh-huh. record it. Okay. That wasn't bad, mm-hmm. but I'm going to edit it. So for a 10 hour book, you wind up having 40 or 50 hours of takes. Right. You know, right. And, and, you know, I've been working on I've been for two months. I've been editing the, the mm-hmm. damn thing. Mm-hmm. And that is miserable. Uh, and you're so. doing that all yourself. It sounds like. Yeah, I do, doing all myself. My, I have a friend, my my the bass player I played with a long time. He, uh, mm-hmm. who also built this wonderful studio. Okay. He uh, he is doing the mastering, but of course, of course, he's got some problems now. Right. So he's it's like oh, we're, we're gonna. I'm hoping we make the deadline. Right. So. Okay. Well, you you just mentioned there'll be an audio book. Will there be a digital version? I'm assuming of it and a hard oh, copy sure. version. Like, how can people get it? Sure. That's that's there's an there's an ebook and there's a a print book and there's an audio book and they'll all be available at the same place. They're there at Amazon. If you don't like uh, corporate uh, book selling, there's there's bookshop.org. Okay. Uh, they're all I I have on on uh, on my website Duncan writes. Uh, dot com there's a there's a page called buy and it gives you all the links <laughs> okay. to i don't get any money out of it mm-hmm. uh i mean eventually i'll get a few bucks, I hope so <laughs> but I hope so. uh but if if you want to there's there's you know it's just it's pretty much everywhere it should mm-hmm. be everywhere mm-hmm. uh, okay. we have a you know big deal distributor so right uh so duncan writes like writes uh like typing okay. uh um dot com slash buy but you'll you'll see the page right uh and nobody will remember that but oh well you know i'll put it in the the video on the bottom of it i'll put a link there for you so that this way as people watch it they can just go click over there oh no you are the man (laughs) so you know you mentioned before and we we touched on one of your books but you know you did put out a couple of books previously in in your lifetime and i know you know you can see from behind me I'm a big Kiss fan, and you know, Kiss fans yeah. know, you know, this book over here, which, which you did. 
I guess this right. was back in like 77, right? Was that your first book you it ever did? came out in 78. 78, It was right. the first book. Yeah, first book I ever did. Okay. And, uh, and the most successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, with KISS fans, that's not a surprise at all, right? But Well, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, one of the things I always remember is it says it in the book, and it said it in some of your Cream Magazine articles as well, you were the world's leading authority on the rock group KISS. So how did that yeah. come about? How did that title come about? Well, that title came about from out of my head. I thought, <laughs> okay. I would, you know, I always approach KISS um, – love the kiss fans mm -hmm. and but i always i always took a tongue-in-cheek uh, sure. uh, approach to it so so i so i was writing all these stories about kiss mm -hmm. in part because it was fun and in part because th by this time i had left cream and gone freelance sure. and you could sell a kiss article <laughs> Absolutely. so they everybody wanted kiss articles so mm -hmm. but i made it my my uh <laughs> My little joke, my mm -hmm. in-joke to myself was I would write a really positive article over here, mm -hmm. and then I would write a negative article. Okay. And, then I, and I, <laughs> I just kind of try to alternate them, and I thought that was kind of funny. And then mm -hmm. I decided that I had written so much I would call myself the world's leading authority, <laughs> and I meant it as a, you know, I meant it as a joke. I still think it's funny. I think but, it's hilarious. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> and look, his fans and are so easy to, to poke. <laughs> <laughs> and when I when I when I did the book, I would did stuff like uh -huh. analyzing their handwriting. Well, I'm not exactly a handwriting analyst, <laughs> yep, but absolutely. I but I thought, but I had set myself a goal of I had to I had to write a certain number of pages per chapter per day. Okay. And as I ran out of stuff to write, that's that's how the I was looking at like Kiss Alive mm -hmm. or something, and mm -hmm. I saw the signatures, and I thought. Yep. Yeah, I could analyze these signatures. How's that? <laughs> and that's one of the things that stick out to me in the book. I remember when I read it, you know, I remember hearing things like Kiss had recorded an album under a different band name, which at the time we didn't know about as fans, right? And I was like yeah. so intrigued, like, ooh, what's that? So there was like that serious side of it. And then it was the side of, like you just said, analyzing the signatures, which as a fan for me, I took it as like, oh, that that's pretty funny. Not, you know, it's a little funny in, in a way. So... I kind of saw both sides of it. It was like a biography, but it was oh. also like a little lighthearted also. Yeah. You know? Oh, that's great because I remember I got a review in the Austin American Statesman, the, the, which was the big newspaper in, in Austin, Texas mm -hmm. at the time. And the guy completely got it. He said, oh, this is this is pretty funny. And, right, right. and it's sung it. And I'm like. So there, I, I was happy that one person got it. Now I know there was two. <laughs> yes, that, that, definitely to me. I, look, I'm sure it was lost on some people, but to me it was obvious. And I, and I did. I liked the biog biography part of it. There was some really yeah. good stuff, especially in, like you said, 78. There was no other Kiss yeah. books. There was no internet. Yeah. So this this was my Kiss Bible as a kid. <laughs> you know. So um, that's. And it's funny how I got that that book contract was I was at a press party for Ozzy Osbourne. Okay. And maybe uh, was that when this was he still in Black Sabbath? Was he solo? It, I can't remember. It must be yeah, seventy-seven. Sabbath. I'm assuming that's like seventy-seven. He was still in Sabbath then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he, it was in what was then the Time Life building in New York. And I remember going up there at, to this press party, and it's like, oh, let me. I want to meet Ozzy. Mm -hmm. And well, Ozzy is uh, here's Ozzy, and they took me over to a really mm -hmm. dark corner. And he was completely just shit faced with his <laughs> chin to his chest. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's like, you know, they got to kind of wake Ozzy up. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, I, so I, I shook his hand. And then, yeah. and then of course, it, we were all broke. So it was like, we go to the press parties to get free food. Mm -hmm. And I'm online for, you know, the buffet. And this guy, um, really nice guy richard robinson richard robinson produced lou reed's first solo record okay yeah and the one before uh walk on the wild side record uh it's the one that has kind of an egg of like a faberge egg illustration on the front okay. and and uh so he was a plug really plugged in hipster dude mm -hmm. was a writer um his wife is is was uh, is lisa robinson who wrote okay. about yeah. fashion and stuff for cream sure. So I, I knew her, but Richard said to me, he says, Hey, um, I know there's an editor looking for a biography of kiss. He said, uh, you know, would you be interested? And he, and he gave me the guy's name and mm -hmm. I 
I called the next day and the guy was, it was like, it was the easiest contract I ever got. So, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so that, that's how they signed me up. But it was funny. It was Ozzy Osbourne to Lou Reed's producer to, uh, to kiss to this editor at the po- at popular library. That, that's pretty incredible. So now you just said before you would sometimes write articles, pro kiss, anti kiss, right? Right. right. What, were you a kiss fan? Well, I, you know, I, I think, and there's nothing wrong with saying, no, I won't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first time I saw kiss, mm-hmm. I, I was, it was one of my first writing assignments, strangely enough. So I go way back with them. They were opening for, I had just, I live in San Francisco Bay area now. Okay. Um, but I lived out here, oh, in the early seventies for okay. about a year. And that's when I started. I gave up on bands in New York, decided I'll go to California. That's where you go to start over. Sure. And uh, and uh, and I thought I'll, that's where I get involved with writing. And I happened to meet a guy who who helped me get you know, who was a Rolling Stone and and Cream writer, by mm-hmm. the way. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was the West Coast editor of Cream. That's how I got in there. Mm-hmm. And. But so one of my first assignments was to go see this band, this opening act at Winterland in San Francisco, famous old place. It's mm-hmm. a place where the Sex, Sex Pistols did their final yep, show. Yep, final show. Um, yep. mm-hmm. And it used to be, a, it's called Winterland because it used to be a giant skating rink. Okay. And, uh, and, and uh, so before the, so it was this band called Kiss. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, the, uh, I went and met them before the show. And it was the day um, Paul had gotten um, the his tattoo. tattoo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like he he walked in while we're all sitting around talking mm-hmm. with, and said, "Oh, look what I just did." Right. Uh, he got it at this from the same guy that I got later got a tattoo from. Oh, nice. And uh, famous guy Lyle Tuttle. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyways, so we had a nice time, and you know, I I was a an intolerant 22 year old <laughs> and uh, maybe I was 21. I was 21. I mm-hmm. was, and I was like, you know, no music shouldn't be all about showbiz. And, mm-hmm. and I went to the show, I went to dinner with um, Bill O'Coin uh, okay. before the show, who was a nice guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyways, we went to the show and I thought, what, what is this showbiz nonsense? This, mm-hmm. you know, where you know with the big sign and the fireworks because even as an opening act in those days they were still sure. doing a kind of, you know a pretty big show for Absolutely. an opening act yep and uh and so i became a fan i i was i started out being like oh man come on. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. I, I was against i thought it was inauthentic and all sure. i my my um thoughts about authenticity have changed <laughs> over okay. a lifetime then that's fair. And you know, look, I say this for years as a huge Kiss fan. I get that they're not for everybody. I get that some yeah. people don't like it. And that's okay. Yeah. Everybody has different tastes yeah. in music. You know, the, so what kind of music did you grow up listening to then? Oh, I grew up, you know, I, I um, well, I grew up listening to the, I mean, the Beatles changed right. my life. Of course. Yep. And Beatles and Stones and, and that the British invasion was, mm-hmm. was, was, that's where I decided, oh, I got to. I got to be a rock star. So from the age of 12, I was playing in bands and uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was a terrible player, but, but like the band I played in, uh, the band I played in, I played bad rhythm guitar and um, we were all 12 year olds and, and nobody, I was the first one whose voice changed. Okay. So they (laughs) said, all right, well, and and at first we were just playing like ventures, instrumentals and stuff, you know, surf music. And they said, no, we got to start playing, you know, British invasion songs. And uh, and uh, I was the first guy whose voice changed. So they said, you got to be the singer because we can't we can't sing. We're right. like, you got we, like we, girl we don't want Greg Brady singing. <laughs> right. So uh, uh, so I, I grew up on that British invasion was mm-hmm. the heart of my beginning. But I had a much older <clears throat> brother and si- half brother and half sister. Mm-hmm. And my brother would was like. He was this rock and roll rebel, and I based the character in in Loudmouth on him. Mm-hmm. He he was a, just a, a maniac, and I remember hearing Elvis's Hound Dog in his hot rod car, you know, d- d- driving hell bent uh, in down the street in Minnesota where we lived before we went to New York. Okay. And uh, so, 
I actually have a connection with the very early days of rock and roll through him and mm-hmm. my old half sister. Mm-hmm. And uh, but and, and you know, the, the first record I bought was Leslie Gore's You Don't Own Me. So that was okay. like okay. What was that 62 or 63. So sure. um, so but British Invasion and then. You know, I was a huge Stones fan, played in Stones uh, cover bands nice. uh, forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I loved the Yardbirds. I loved, uh, you know, and then as it got into the 70s, you know, I liked. Um, oh, God, I went for a lot of that, that kind of uh, pastoral, uh, like the dead, working man's dead. OK, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beauty. Sure, um, sure. Which which uh, I don't disavow. I think those are great records. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and then I then I when I moved to Detroit, I I I was I was introduced to the cult of uh, of uh, Detroit music, mm-hmm. in particular Iggy Pop and the MC5. MC5. So, yeah. mm-hmm. Absolutely. So uh, so it, it went on from there. But but I I like a lot of different music. That's cool. I know one of the things that always stuck out to me in this book is at the very beginning, you have your name and it says Gumjoy, New York. Right. And now when I'm reading the new book, there's a Gumjoy in there again right now. So I've lived in New York my entire life. I've never heard of Gumjoy. So I'm guessing there's some backstory behind this, right? Because it it made into the Loudmouth book as well. So share with us what that means. Well, we lived at, 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 in a building at 5426 Avenue, which is still there, mm-hmm. and it's still boarded up. Uh, but we, we lived there, and, and we lived, we got Lester Bangs an apartment there, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he moved to New York, we were living on the same floor right next door. Um, and downstairs was a Chinese restaurant, but it was like an old-school Chinese restaurant from, like, the 50s. Okay. And it had it. It had a, like a big neon sign and kind of fake Chinese letters okay. that said, and it was called Gum Joy. Gotcha. And it was like, and I'd ask people, Do you, what does Gum Joy mean? Oh, well, I don't know. You know <laughs> even people I knew who spoke Chinese didn't know it. I say this in the book. Mm-hmm. And so I guessed, I guessed it meant happy mouth. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and nobody disproved that. But so it was. <laughs> I mean, so all our cockroaches that we had in <laughs> just plentitude, uh-huh. uh, they all came from Gum Joy. From gum. The smell of a kind of bad Cantonese food mm-hmm. came from Gum mm-hmm. Joy, mm-hmm. and uh, so it became a thing. So you could, you could definitely, if you told somebody, "Oh, look for the Gum Joy sign." So we were our little door was right next to the That's under okay. the sign. We mm-hmm. were actually we were there was a sign. It said "Cocktails Gum Joy." Um, my wife's a photographer. She took a picture. She has a picture of Lester Banks. She has a picture of me standing. The cocktails part of the sign was right under, right over <laughs> our, right over you. our door. Right, right, so right. right. It, was so, a, it was appropriate because there was a lot of cocktails going on in that yeah. building. Well, that, that makes sense to me. And I had a feeling, like I said, there was some kind of backstory there because, like I said, I noticed that it was in the Loudmouth book. And knowing that the book is fictional but based off of your experiences like that this this, this is not a coincidence this is not a coincidence no it just was such a wacky name and and, uh, so again like we were into having i was into having fun and making fun and absolutely so that's what it's all about to make so did kiss uh, the bill of coin ever say anything to you about the book did you ever get any feedback from them on it i i did from you know it was funny gene um gene said to our mutual friend jan uhelski another cream mm-hmm. person cream. Mm-hmm. uh said uh said well that duncan really gets into the obscure stuff <laughs> uh so he was he and i heard others were, were kind of mystified by it okay. they thought what this is and um oh you, a few years later i ran it well every once in a while i would run into gene mm-hmm. and so gene and i kind of had a had a good nice relationship we were friendly i and i would tease him which other people wouldn't do (laughs) that i think you know cream would do that in the writing but it was also it was just something i always did i wasn't going to accept you were a big deal rock star i was gonna i remember the first time i met gene and he was i'm not short but he was way taller than me Mm -hmm. and so I, i we were at a press party and it was out at a it was really interesting it was like an kind of an old school pool building you know i mean swimming pool not 
not no, billiards, right. mm-hmm. okay. but uh, out in Queens. And uh, they were in, it was kind of, it was a cool building and they were having this press party there. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was for a live, I don't know which one. Okay. And, um, and so I was chatting with Gene. I'm like, Gene, you're too tall. So I went and got a chair <laughs> and I stood on a chair. So I was taller than him. So that was my relationship with Gene. But Gene, I think Gene liked it because, because he was, you probably get tired of people kissing your ass all the time. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. he was, uh, he enjoyed it. So Gene, I used to run into Gene and we would, I would banter a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right. And one time I, I, there, I, I, you know, I did an interview recently where I told this, but I was living in New York. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm, um, and my friend, one of my childhood friends was a stage manager and he stage managed for Liza Minnelli and he wound up getting married to her. So he was the only straight guy she married. And <laughs> So That's great. he was a he was a little guy from you know he was like a a, a guy from not a wealthy background or uh-huh. anything. So he when he turned thirty he was married to her and he said to her, um, "Okay, I want you to invite everybody you know in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and we'll have a party at, at the at the apartment. They had a you know fantastic apartment on the Upper East Side, mm-hmm. and uh, and so I'm I get invited to the party. We, we were over there all the time. Oh yes. <laughs> It was just crazy, but I'm I'm in the kind of front area of the apartment talking to Meatloaf, mm-hmm. um, whose whose wife is telling he's getting another you know hors d'oeuvre, and his mm-hmm. wife's you can't no you shouldn't be doing that you know <laughs> and blah, blah blah so his wife's giving him shit about his mm-hmm. eating and his weight, and which was it was just kind of funny, uh-huh. uh, and and it was Meatloaf and Harvey Keitel, so okay. that was like mm-hmm. it was just. It was just great. The whole party was fantastic. Al Pacino and and Lucille Ball and Gregory Peck and just Hollywood royalty like crazy. But anyways, I'm standing there talking to these guys and I hear like a knock at the door and nobody's paying attention. So I slide over to the door Mm -hmm. and I open the door. And who is it but Gene Simmons Mm -hmm. with his date, who the woman he was dating at the time, which was Diana Ross. (laughs) Okay. so. So he's like, not in a thousand years did he expect to find me right. at this fancy <laughs> Hollywood party. So he's like, he points at me and mm-hmm. I point at him mm-hmm. and he says, well, let me introduce you to my date, mm-hmm. Diana Ross. Diana Ross. And mm-hmm. she looked, you know, big hair and mm-hmm. big smile. She was totally. I'm guessing this I'm, is like 1980, 1981, it sounds like, right? It, it, it was, yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It was before I moved to California. So I moved here in 84. And, okay, and, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I moved back here in 84, but that okay. was, the, yeah, it was around 80, 81. Yeah. Right. Right. Very interesting. I mean, that would, now that's, so my relationship with Gene is based on teasing each other. So he, he did comment on the kiss book mm-hmm. and, and thought it was kind of, you know, strange, but in an amused way, he said. And, and everything I've heard from people who know him and talk to him that he does have a good sense of humor like that. You know, some of the other yeah. band members, maybe not as much, but from yeah. everything I hear, he's, he's, he's the type of person that would appreciate your types of books, actually, from what I've heard. Yeah, and he appre- I, and I find this, that, that people like him appreciate it when you kind of challenge them. Right. They, mm-hmm. Like when I'm standing on the chair uh, and I just run into many people say, oh, my God, that guy's scary to talk to. And I'll go talk to him and I'll mm-hmm. be like, what? Why is he, why do you think he's scary? Because I'll... I'll give shit back. Right, you know? right, exactly. So. Right. You keep it real. It's person to person, and yeah. you're not like, oh my god, this is superstar or whatever. Right. You know, right. One of the things I love in the book here, and then I want to talk to you about some cream stuff, is um, at the end you kind of make some predictions of what's going to happen in Kiss, <laughs> and I don't know if you've looked at these anytime recently, but um, I haven't. So it's actually pretty interesting. Gene Simmons will appear in films. Oh, you got yeah. that one right, you know. Well, he always talked. To, he always talked. To, he, you know, he wanted to be a horror movie star. Right. So. Yeah. No. So yeah, look, Paul will marry in eighteen months. You're a few months off on that, and maybe a few years off. But he did marry a couple of times. Um, yeah. Gene will write a book heavily about his childhood. Right. He did yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, Gene will. This is an interesting one. Gene will script and produce a film with s- sexual scenes in it, and Paul Stanley will have a cameo. All right, I'm glad that one didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but but I look at some of these, I'm like, you know what, you obviously, as much as it's a little tongue in cheek, some of the stuff you were pretty much spot on about. Well, that's because I'm a, that's because I'm a soothsayer. <laughs> I'm, 
I should open a, I should open a psychic store. I was going to say, I think, and you know, I think the last sentence in the book says something along the lines of, you know, in 2001, Kislev put out 36 albums. And I forget if it's like 15 or 16 videos. Now, again, yeah. this is 1977, 78. People weren't putting out videos. The numbers yeah. might be slightly off, but the concept is there. I, I think you missed your calling in another line oh, of business. I'm, yeah. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, uh, that's why I'm so stinking rich because I predicted the stock market. <laughs> no, no. Uh, if only, Not right? Rich and I didn't predict the stock market. But, and and but, if you had, we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking then. And anybody out there wants to send me their money to invest. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. So yeah, send, we, send it to Mike first and he'll send it on. Okay. I, I like that partnership here. <laughs> um, so you, you've mentioned cream a couple of times during this conversation, yeah. right? So how did you get started there? Obviously you were in bands growing up as a kid. They didn't quite right. work out. Um, at right. what point do you transition over to rock journalism and, and working for cream? Well, I, you know, I had this, I was in a bunch of bands and I mm -hmm. love playing. I, I still love playing a band. I played in bands up. I mean, I, I, technically, I still have a band, but we just haven't played in a few years. But, right. okay. um, and I still have a studio, you know. Nice. I used I used to see people like uh, um, Todd Rundgren, who would do everything in the studio himself, mm -hmm. and that was what I aspired to. So I have drums over there, and I have guitars over there, and I have a bass in the other room, and mm -hmm. and uh, so, so I was. Um, so, anyways, I was in bands and 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 continued to be interested in that, and. But I got tired of the drummer quitting and the guitarist <laughs> mm -hmm. flaking out and whatever. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I wanted to do something I could do on my own. I was always a good writer, as I said. And so I went to California. I thought, well, I'll go out there. And one day I'm looking for an apartment in, in Sausalito. There's a version of this story in, in Loudmouth, but it, mm -hmm. I put it in New York. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking for an apartment, and I'm in Sausalito, California, and um, – and I, I'm looking for a cheap apartment, and I see a basement apartment, and it says for rent, and I'm like, okay, that's it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I park my car and I run it over there, and here come running from the other side is this guy who looks like a hell's angel. He's got this long black hair. Mm -hmm. He's wearing a black cowboy hat and black shades, and he's got this goatee that comes to a point. He did look like a satanic biker dude, <laughs> okay, and, mm -hmm. and kind of big burly guy, and you know. And uh, he, he says, hey, I got it. He yells out to me, mm -hmm. you know, not in a friendly way. OK. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, because I'd been looking for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. And and so I so I said it was the end of the day of looking. So I said, hey, you mind if I just look anyways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but don't get any ideas. You know, he was really <laughs> busting mm -hmm. my chops. Right, right. And uh, so I. I go into the apartment and it's like, all right, it's cool. And he comes in with his box. He had been carrying a box and he puts the box down mm -hmm. and under the box, he's wearing a lanyard with a press pass on it. And I'm like, Oh, why, you know, why do you have that? He says, well, I'm a, I'm a writer and editor. I said, Oh yeah. I said, who do you write for? And he's like, Rolling Stone, Cream, mm -hmm. uh, Esquire, what, you know, he went, it just went on and on. Sure. And I'm thinking, Oh shit! This is. I said I'm trying to get involved in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this guy turned out to be Edward, who was the the rock historian on on uh, NPR on the Fresh Air show for many years, mm -hmm. and and Ed and I got to be friends. And uh, and and basically, Ed taught me everything I know about writing journalism mm -hmm. and how to, how to deal with it. He made me, I kind of worked as his assistant for a while, you know, unpaid. Okay. He would say, mm -hmm. transcribe this tape, which is a real chore. Mm -hmm. And my typing wasn't so good in those days. So, <laughs> okay. But so Ed, Ed Ward, uh, who used to, who was one of the early editors at Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he introduced me to, so we, he's a big cook too. So we used to eat dinner all the time. And mm -hmm. the other bachelor that we were hanging out with was this guy john morthland okay. and john morthland was again a, a, a lot of people don't know him but he was a great writer and amazing ears and he was like a guy who knew about country and he knew about hip-hop okay. he was fantastic and he was a pioneer in all those fields mm -hmm. and he he wound up getting hired as an as editor at cream okay and and he called me up and said I was trying to, you know, I had done some, by this time I had done a few, some freelance stuff, including for Cream. Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, you want, we're looking for a copy boy. You want to come out there? And mm -hmm. and at the time I didn't have a full-time job. I'm like, oh yeah. Right. I, 
you know, two hundred dollars a week sounded like you know a fortune. Sure. <laughs> so I went to Detroit and uh, and Lester Banks and John Morthland picked me up at the airport in Lester's car okay. and we went and got drunk and and then I worked for Cream and that and and I didn't know that um, you know forty years later it would be it would still be relevant. I knew there was some really cool stuff going on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I didn't know. But that's how. Right. So to that point. Right, you just said how 40 years later it's still relevant. A yeah. documentary you just released, I think, last week about Cream, right? So, yeah. you know, what yeah. was your involvement in that? And, you know, looking, have you seen it yet? And looking back, what did you think of it? I've seen it about 10 or 15 times because <laughs> okay. the, after they interviewed me, mm -hmm. they interviewed me. Uh, anyways, they interviewed me and the guy said, hey, would you, the director called me. I was, inter we were, I was interviewed by Jan, as a matter of fact. And and this and the cameraman, but the, I didn't meet the director. He called me. He called me on the phone. And said, "Hey, that interview was really great." And he said, "Would you do some? Would you do some voiceover Voice for us?" Mm -hmm. So I, I I I did. I did some voiceover, and then he and then he said, "You know," he called me up. And said, "You know, we don't really have a thing about Lester's death." He said, "Could you write something and you know record it? Record? I'm using the same microphone I did for that." Oh wow. Uh, but I uh, and I said Sh sure, and I so I wrote a thing, and uh, which, which was the truth because Lester and I were were, were very close, mm -hmm. and uh, and then he was the the director Scott Crawford is a really nice guy. We got to be great friends on the phone, and so he was calling me all the time, asking me stuff about Cream, mm -hmm. sending me cuts of the film, and saying, "What do you think of this? What do you think of that?" And uh, so, in the end, I spent a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of a year uh working with him on the film and at the end you know i didn't ask him for any money i was just excited to have the cream survive and that sure. whole era kind of memorialized mm -hmm. and uh so he uh he said look i i'm, I'm gonna make you story consultant on the film and uh, so he did. So I got, I got, yeah, I got my nice little credit at the beginning. Mm -hmm. yep. I noticed none of my friends are seeing it yet. It's like I get, I am a guy who watches the credits and I say, oh, I know that, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. That, right, but right. I guess well, nobody else does. Well, I can so. tell you so far, the feedback from fans has been enormously positive about the film. Everybody seems. I know you're not going to believe this, right? You'll say, oh no, no, people. No, just the so... reviews have been fantastic. <laughs> okay, so you believe this one? You don't believe the book well, reviews? Well, I believe it. I, it's not my film. Oh, okay, I, there you go. <laughs> I help. Yeah. Uh, fair if it was enough. My film, I wouldn't believe it. There you go. Fair enough. Now, what do you remember about when Crean came to an end, right? I think it was, what, 1989? You weren't there anymore. But, you know, from the outside looking in, was that something disappointing to you? Or what do yeah, you remember? it was disappointing. And mm -hmm. but it but it had been trashed, I felt, mm -hmm. you know. And this is nothing against the people who worked on it, you know, but it, they took it out to L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this new guy bought it, took it out to L.A. Mm -hmm. and was trying to make it something kind of different, like a fashion, more fashion-y you know, more, more trendy and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and it seemed kind of gross to me. That's not my thing. And, uh, and, and I remember, uh, talking to, maybe I was talking to Jan and she says, I said, so they're going to get us all to work for, write for them again. And, mm -hmm. and, and she was like, no, they said they don't want any of the old cream writers. They want oh, wow. completely cut. And so I'm like, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was pretty sure it wasn't going to make it because it, I thought it was shitty. Right, right. That's that's too bad. During your time there, what do you remember, like, in terms of, like, who, what was your most memorable interview or most memorable article that you wrote? Oh, it has to be. Uh, I mean, it, it was all, it was, it, one, it was a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. It was on, on the professional and the personal level. Very, it, it was fun and it was wild and it was, and it was hard work too. But mm -hmm. I think the best interview, <clears throat> the best interview I ever did was I did a thing with Springsteen where I, it was the Darkness tour, Darkness okay, yeah. in the Edge of Town, mm -hmm. and he was, uh, he was going on the bus from Houston to New Orleans to Jackson, Mississippi, so kind of a southern, uh, southeast run of the of his tour, and uh, I had met him a couple times. I had met him in there's a piece in, in Loudmouth where Bruce call, calls up and asks me to come from Detroit when I was living in Detroit down mm -hmm. to Cleveland. Mm 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's a true story. Mm-hmm. That whole thing is true. Nice. And we're driving around with this guy who is a crazy driver, and he's given it. I said, well, I said to Bruce, I said, let, let me get this guy I know from Cleveland to give us a tour of Cleveland. So, mm-hmm. um, so anyways, uh, but the story was I wrote a story for Cream, and I thought, okay, I think this is my best story I've ever written by far. Mm-hmm. And I remember when we went to um, – when we went to Springsteen was playing at the garden. It was the first time he'd played the garden and it was kind of like a homecoming show. You know, mm-hmm. he'd got, he'd been on the cover of time and Newsweek and all this. Sure. And he, uh, and at, at the end of the show, we were supposed to meet him backstage and there was a big crowd of people, rock stars mm-hmm. and just rich people and politicians and, and all this stuff. And, and they had us all like kind of in a cafeteria, like the employee cafeteria of Madison square garden. Mm-hmm. And, and, and me and my wife were sitting way in the back of the room, and uh, Bruce came in the door after the show, his first appearance in the room, everybody mm-hmm. paused, and uh, triumphant show. Mm-hmm. And he walked all the way through all the rich people and rock stars and walks to our table and sits down. Nice. And he <laughs> says, he says, I just got to tell you, he says, I think that's the best article ever written about me since the uh, John Landau, the rock and roll future sure. story. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, but, I didn't believe it, but it was still. I was going to say, <laughs> did you believe that? And that's something obviously well, you don't forget. I, I, well, he made such an, it was so great mm-hmm. to see everybody turning to, where is he going? Where is he going? Right. Mm-hmm. Went, he went to us. Right. And right. that was cool. So that, That's uh, very cool. Now, you mentioned before also that, you know, over the years you wrote not just for Cream, but you were part of articles in Circus Magazine, I think Hip yeah. Parade, Rolling Stone Magazine, right? So you pretty much covered the gamut in terms of rock magazines. What was the I, difference like when you were submitting and writing for them? I wrote, I wrote for, there is not a, I can't remember a rock mag. I wrote right. for Rolling Stone too. I could, yep. There is not a rock magazine I, I, uh, I didn't write for, mm-hmm. and I had columns in a couple of those kind of smaller ones. There was a magazine called G- Gig. Yep. Where they, yep. I know that. Gave, yeah. So they gave me a column. I asked them for a column, and they mm-hmm. so they gave me a column, and I could just do write about anything. Mm-hmm. And I wish I had some of those stories, but I don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I've tried to find them online. Find you know, and I, I found some gig magazines. Okay. But so they let me just do anything. Right. And. Uh, but I was pretty lucky. Well, Rolling Stone was pretty, um, you know, mm, regimented. I would think, right. mm-hmm. you, you had to write a certain way. You know, I reviewed the um, Kiss solo albums mm-hmm. that when the four albums came out. I reviewed those for I, Dave Marsh was a record reviews editor. He had been at Cream, and I was writing for record reviews for him. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to review those Kiss records, so I did. Mm-hmm. And Jan Wenner killed the review because. Why is that? Well, and of course, it was positive. It, um, I don't even know if it was positive. But it <laughs> okay. Was, because it was too playful, okay. silly, mm-hmm. what juvenile. I don't know what he called it. Mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. but Marsh let it go. But, okay. but Wenner himself. Wouldn't. Yeah. And he, he also hated Kiss. Right. Know? Well, that's why I jokingly said, well, it must have been positive. So he didn't want anything positive yeah. in the magazine. Yeah, I think there was some positive stuff. But right. he was like, no. And uh, so, um, so there was a di- Rolling Stone was very different from mm-hmm. Gig. I could write anything. Cream, mm-hmm. Cream. Uh, you know, uh, it wasn't very regimented. Mm-hmm. You know? right. mm-hmm. I had a lot, a ton of freedom. Probably too much for a, a beginning writer. It didn't it, it, I think you'd you'd learn faster if you if you had more guide, right. you know, guardrails. You know. So then, saying that. In my mind, it would be, and I'm not a writer, but I would think that it's easier to write an article, let's just say for Cream or Circus, yada, 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 any of those, as opposed to writing a book like you did right now, right? Is, is that a true statement? Is the book a lot harder to write than, than an article? Oh, infinitely harder. Mm-hmm. And, and, well, you know, when I wrote the Kiss book, I thought, I, I just to get my head around it, I thought, okay, this is going to be like 19 articles. I forget how many chapters right. are in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I thought each chapter is an article. This is going to be like, you know, 19 articles. And that's how I could. Mm-hmm. So every day you got to mm-hmm. crank out a certain number of pages and an article a week or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but, you know, that and it's circus. I remember I started writing for circus. Um, this guy, wonderful guy, Paul Nelson, who was who he's in that that Dylan documentary the the, the one that Scorsese did. Uh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. No Direction Home. Right. And he was a guy who lended lent. 
he he's from Minnesota. He's gone now, but he he lent Dylan all these folk records mm -hmm. when Dylan was just you know a young guy hanging around. Sure. And so he had a huge influence on Dylan. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, Paul Nelson was the nicest guy. He was older than all of us, but he was the nicest guy. And I, and for a time he was record reviews editor at Circus. And when I left Cream and I came to New York, I thought, oh man, what am I going to do? Because I got in kind of a oh, let's you know I I didn't leave correctly from cream I, I kind of stormed off in the middle of the night oh, no. <laughs> and uh i was mad at the publisher everybody got mad at the publisher okay at some point and it, although i i found him i kind of liked him okay. but, uh, <laughs> and he's uh, and i'm glad he's in the i'm glad he's featured in the documentary mm -hmm. he he makes he made you know he put the thing together sure. but uh yes uh uh Anyway, what was I don't even know what I was saying. But the, <laughs> so so could the, yes, articles. It was I had much more freedom. Right. Uh, but I, I would I would think a book at the end of the day oh, again. Oh, circus. Yeah, sir, go I was good. No, go ahead. Circus. No, please go. So I, I wrote for circus and I did a bunch of stories and reviews and all this stuff. And then I remember Jerry Rothberg, the publisher, um, said to me, "Would you like to be the editor of Circus when somebody right. left?" Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I thought, well, no, I'm going to be. I'm on the verge of becoming a big novelist. I'm right. going to write a novel. And, of course, this was, at the time, I was 22 or 3. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. I thought, you know, no. I'm, I'm <laughs> on that now. And and so I'm way beyond 23 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, But now I would have to think that having a book out like Loudmouth that's coming out in a few weeks, that has to be, at the end of the day, more satisfying. It's a lot more work, but I'd have to think that when you're done with a body of work like that, it's like, what, 300 some some odd pages long? Yeah. You've yeah. got to feel sure. satisfied to finish something like that, knowing it's being published and saying, hey, this is, I know it's a novel, but it's it's based off yeah. of your life, right? It's got to be satisfying. It's terrifying <laughs> and satisfying. And it really, I mean, I'm still, you know, maybe in a couple of years, I'll think it's satisfying. It's satisfying every day when you, when you write something you think is good and then you, of course you discover the next day you think, well, that sucks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, so that, that there's satisfactions along the way else you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now I'm in the terrifying part. I'm afraid of <laughs> what, what reviews will say about it. <clears throat> I'm afraid what the people I fictionalized in the novel mm -hmm. will say about it, mm -hmm. including it, friends and family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm kind of in the, I mean, so, the, so, so far, those friends and families that you fictionalized in the book, they haven't given you any comments one way or another? Well, I have shown it to them. <laughs> they know or they suspect they're, they're in it. So. Uh -huh. Well, I, I actually, I've done a bunch of readings online, so, so they've seen some of that. And I forget. I'm reading it online. Mm -hmm. I'm just using it as social media content. I mean, uh -huh. I, like, I like reading it. But, um, <laughs> but I forget that I've exposed some person who I named and – I did get one one call from a friend said, oh, uh, he says, don't you think you're going to get sued by this guy? But by this or that guy, I have a character in the book mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. does some nasty stuff. He, right. I'm like, well, I said I changed his name. He's not going to know. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, you didn't change it a lot. <laughs> but it's it's a fictional book, right? So well, at the yeah. end of the day, you changed yeah, the exactly. name. You didn't use this person's name. You changed the no. name. It's a it's a fictional book. Oh no, I'm completely legally unsafe, right. but but I'm not safe from a, you know a determined assassin. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody's going to do that over a book. But you know, hey, look, today's day and age, you never know, right? You never know. You never know. You never know. <laughs> so I know also somewhere along the way you were attributed to a quote about heavy metal that pretty much said like it was dismal, it was horrible, yeah. it was terrible. I'm assuming based on some of the things you said that that was probably a little bit tongue in cheek based on you know, uh, some of the music you listen to. But but I've seen that quote attributed to you many times over the years. So, right. Well, what's that about? I, was that a joke? You know, kind of everything's a joke to me. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I, I kind of don't take anything too seriously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, let's see. It was said something. Yes, it was dismal. And I forget. I didn't know the quote was out there till I. I came across it in somebody else's book, okay, uh, uh, and uh, or and it's on Wikipedia too. Uh -huh. Oh God! And, and, and uh, so, yeah, you know, I think there's some, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think who's great heavy metal. Uh, 
Well, I, you know, do you call Blue Oyster Cult great heavy metal? I, I mean, do you call them heavy metal? Right. They're hard rock, maybe. Right. When they started, they were more mm-hmm. metal So, you know, I'm a huge fan of Blue Oyster Cult and became great mm-hmm. friends with them over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. I, 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 I'm... I'm, in, you know, I'm ambivalent. There's good heavy metal. There's terrible heavy metal. Absolutely agreed. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so yeah. I'm what, just, what was the last article that you had published? Do you remember? Uh, oh, I wrote for a little bit for um, for a, there was a one of the early music websites was called Addicted to Noise. Do you okay. remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, and it was it was just. This guy was, he's telling me, okay, well, you know, he's telling me how to send him the copy. And it's like, I didn't have email. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> you know, it was, it was that early. Mm-hmm. And he's, he, uh, Michael Goldberg, had, it was, Jan worked for him, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and uh, Michael Goldberg, who had been at Rolling Stone, and had given the noise a rave review in Rolling Stone, okay. which was the greatest thing in my life Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know i was i was working for bank of america at the time as a copywriter Mm -hmm. and i i would go i was like just so down and i would go at lunch to get you know rock magazines that i could read with my peanut butter and jelly sandwich (laughs) and 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 i got the latest issue of rolling stone i'm opening it and then i see Ah, that's my book that's cover. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. And I thought I thought they were going to savage it, but, but it was a review by Michael Goldberg, and he gave it a great review. But anyway, so I wrote for I wrote a story for him for Addicted to Noise about Guided by Voices, mm-hmm. who is one of my favorite all time favorite bands, and uh, I, I can't remember what I've written since then. You know, mm-hmm. I, I did a I, I've done a blog here about we have a I do this blog about this crazy restaurant and okay. town, town i live in called fairfax okay and uh so i i i, I publish you know i'm out there a lot with mm-hmm. but it's you know nobody's paying me to do it uh, right. <laughs> you're just doing it because uh, you enjoy but of course i'm not sure any writers get paid anymore it's That's just such a, sad such, but true. it's like musicians it's like yeah. musicians Very it's, sad it's but like true. i don't know what's going to happen to culture when you can't make a living at it mm-hmm. so Mm-hmm, absolutely. So now then let me ask you, do you keep up with current music at all? Or like, do you stop it? You know, once you got out of the industry, did you stop listening to new music? No, I can't, you know, I kept listening, you know, I'm nice. trying to think. And I, and, you know, when you write a book, I can't listen to music while I'm writing. Because sure. it's like, I'm trying to make my own rhythms. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm trying to write my own words. Of course, I can't even listen to instrumental, though, because it messes with my rhythm. I, okay. I write. <laughs> I write like a song. I try to make all my my writing is like I try to make it like music mm-hmm. uh, with rhythm and 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 so so the last five or six years I've been working on this book, so I haven't listened to much, you know. Sure. And uh, but you know I, I I like I said, you know, in, in the early two thousands, I discovered Guided by Voices. They became one of my favorite bands. Sure. I'm trying to think. I, I made a list or. I, I gave somebody recently a list of current bands that I'm interested in. And, okay. uh, I, I, uh, you know, you know, and like the other day I saw, I, I was interested in Billie Eilish uh-huh. and I thought, oh, wow. well, okay. let, me, let me, let me check this stuff out. And I thought, wow, she's really good. Right. And, and I listened to that, you know, that there's that new bond theme she did. Okay. And I thought, this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. This is fantastic. So mm-hmm. there is, I, I have, I do not believe that, back in the day was when music was good i think music is That's just as good or better today mm-hmm. uh i'm not I, i'm just i'm totally in favor of let's go forward and you so know. then i would guess that you don't so gene simmons is a number of times over the years said rock is dead i'm assuming you would not agree with him there well yeah and i and you can define it you know um if you put hip-hop into uh the category of rock mm-hmm. uh you know that's that's it's very lively mm-hmm. genre mm-hmm. and uh oh i don't think rock is dead at all i mean there's that's always awesome. there's there's people all these bedroom musicians you know mm-hmm. and and you now you've got the internet and you've got you can do your own promotion i mean it was in the day when kiss was 
uh, signed. You had to get signed to a major label. So mm -hmm. I mean, so you had these and these just jackasses as gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. You know, the you know there was there was some great A and R guys and there was some really not great ones. Mm -hmm. And so, but they are determining you know what we're going to listen to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the book Loudmouth, right? We said that yes, it's, it's fiction, mouth. but but it's. It's based off of you. Is Loudmouth, yeah. is that you? Are you the Loudmouth? Well, I would say so. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty damn loud. Um, and, you know, yeah, all I, it, it's, I have put it the words in the character's mouth, but uh, yeah, all my life I've had people going like this to me, shh. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not talking loud. Uh -huh. I finally figured out that I, I have some disconnects between my auditory and my, and the, my the, mouth. Interesting. That, that, that I don't, that I don't, I don't hear myself as loud as other people hear. Okay. Me. Oh well, you haven't seen but loud. All my life, people are going, "Hey, hey, <laughs> be quiet!" Funny. I go, "I'm whispering." What are you talking about? That's funny. And then in the book, you also say that the character is shy. Were you also shy? Oh, I think yes. Before I hit puberty, I was shy. <laughs> then I, um, then the then the the chemicals inside my body made me not shy. Okay. And uh, and you know so that I learned how to chase girls and all that. There you go. That'll always help, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what are you hoping to, comes out of the book being published? And what's your goal for this? What are you hoping to accomplish? Well, I, I it would be nice to, well, it would be nice to get a, a deal for another novel. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to get, you know, give me one good review and I'll go away. Wow. And, <laughs> So I, you know, but again, at this point, after after five or six years, I'm I'm not so sure I ever want to write a book again. But that that will pass. I have a, I have another one that I've been working that I was working on simultaneously, mm. uh, very different book, not a, a very personal book. Okay. Uh, but um, so I hope I get to finish that book. I hope I get uh, one or two good reviews, uh, and I hope I hope it sells a few copies. You know. I know people don't read anymore, and uh, and uh, but you're giving them options. You give them the digital, digital. You're giving them the hard copy. You're giving them the audio, right? So the just... audio book is, you know, when I finish it, it's killer. I just, mm -hmm. I, I think I did a great performance of it. So, and you know, I, I don't really listen to audio books, but the only time I will listen to an audio book is if the author is is doing. Agreed. Agree. One hundred percent agree. You know, like like. And I was listening to Bruce Springsteen doing that. His Born to Run, it was like, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Right. And right. John right. Darnielle from the Mountain Goats. Mountain Goats is another band mm -hmm. I love. Okay. And him, he, he did his own audio book. Right. So. Right. Yeah. No, there's nothing worse to me than, let's just say, listening to a Bruce Springsteen book voiced by somebody like me. Right. I'm, I'm not Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I shouldn't be. You know, oh, or when they hire some, you know, some real announcery guy. Such a you disconnect know? there. I want to hear Bruce Springsteen reading his book. That's the way yeah. it should be. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you said the book's coming out October 6th, right? It comes out October 6th, but you can pre-order it now because you're going to forget. That's right. If you're at all interested in this topic, which I'm not sure everybody is, but if you're <laughs> at all interested, you know, you're not going to remember this in five weeks when mm -hmm. the thing comes out, six weeks. So pre-order it now. You can pre-order Amazon, bookshop.org, or you can just go to my my uh, my website, Duncan, DuncanWrites.com, and there's a buy tab on there. Right. And it was Duncan Wrights, W-R-I. Duncan Wrights, W-R-I-T-E-S. Right? Perfect. Because my name is so common. There's so many Robert Duncans in the world. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. sure. Absolutely. Uh, when I wrote the Kiss book, there's a famous poet, uh, San Francisco, now departed, Robert Duncan, mm -hmm. and he was you know, an important guy, kind of overlapped with the Beats. And uh, when my, I wrote the Kiss book, um, they there's the publishing industry has a book called Books in Print, and they put all all the books get published so booksellers could refer to it. Uh, it's, now, of course, it's digital, mm -hmm. but my book, I look uh, so I looked in it, and it's like my book was. Kiss book was under Robert Duncan, the poet. The oh no! Poet. Yeah, and I thought, boy, what is what is Robert Duncan, the serious poet, think of you know, <laughs> being associated kiss with a kiss book? book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's hilarious, actually. Yeah. Well, to me, you know, I said before, this was my Bible as a kid, the Kiss book. Yeah. Kiss fans love this book. 
Kiss fans Super should five. go out and pick out Loudmouth as well, right? Support yeah. you. I think, you know, we love this. I think they'll love the Loudmouth book. You know, to me, you know, I'll just close this with saying this to me. I, I've read the book. It's like a coming of age book. It's a little bit like an almost famous type of vibe, right? And people love yeah. that. So um, sure. if you love those kind of, if you love the Kiss book, if you love Almost Famous, if you love this stuff, you're going to love the book Loudmouth. I could say it's good. So you, I'm going to ask you to believe me on this one, okay? All and, right, um, Mike. And, and I'm yeah, telling you, this. and I'm telling other people watching this, you guys are going to like this. It's a great story. It's a lot of fun. Um, go pick it up. Click that link. Buy it. You guys will really enjoy it. Oh, uh, you guys are the great. You're the greatest, Mike. Thank you. Well, thank you. And is there anything else that you wanted people to know about either the book, yourself, your career, or anything else you wanted to let people know about? You know, if anybody wants that, that I reissued the Kiss book. Yes, because the copyright reverted to me, so I oh, reissued. Nice. Okay. I reissued the Kiss book. Of, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. I because I got a call from a guy who said, "Hey, I want to do an audio book of your Kiss book," and I'm mm -hmm. like, "Well, okay, I'll let you do it if you do if you reissue the print edition," because mm -hmm. I didn't want to deal with it. And he's, he's like, oh, "I just do audio books," and I'm like, "Well, okay, well, then forget it." I don't know why I was being such a hard ass. But, <laughs> okay. uh, so I decided I would reissue because there was Lulu, you know, that Amazon thing. Yep. And mm -hmm. um, you can do. And so and somebody in in my where I work were like still kind of work. Um, they did a I they they knew that I wrote that kiss book. So mm -hmm. somebody did for my birthday one year. They did a painting of me in a suit and tie with Gene Simmons makeup. Is that makeup the new on. cover of the book? Gene Simmons makeup on, uh -huh. and I got my cup of tea. I drank tea. Yes, okay. And, and and when I was when I was reissuing the Kiss book, I said, "Oh, it'd be nice to do a facsimile edition." But then I realized I'd have to track down the photographers and pay for photography, and sure. I didn't want to do that. Right, right. right and right. so, and I was sitting there in my office, and I saw the painting on the wall, and I thought, "Oh shit, that's gonna be." You. <laughs> I never realized so, that was you. <laughs> That's that's me okay. in Kiss makeup. That was a birthday present. So, that, so anyway, that that's that's out there on Amazon if you if you if you want it. Right. And so now, and it's sub self published by you. So if they go yeah. to Amazon, you get that money directly. It's not going to a publishing house or whatever. Yeah. Well, every awesome. every like three months, I get like a check for seven dollars from. <laughs> Like it sold two copies. Right, you know? right, right. Well, I'll make sure definitely so, to put the link to that in, in here as well because I'm, yeah, I, I've seen that. I never realized that was you on the cover all the, uh, these last few years. I never realized that. Nobody knows it, but it, but it just saved me having to pay a photographer. Which totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. <laughs> well, certainly Kiss fans should check that out. My copy's beat up, so maybe I'll go get another copy as well just to have a nice clean yeah, I gave copy. It, I put a new intro on it, too. Oh, okay. Nice. So, nice. Uh, so I thought, oh, I got to like add something. I can't just make it a straight-up reprint. Absolutely. Well, definitely Kiss fans should want to check that out, right? Kiss fans want everything in their collection, so make sure you guys go check that out on Amazon. Yeah. And like I said, the book Loudmouth coming out October 6th. Make sure Kiss fans and everybody else watching this, make sure Is you pick it up. It yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a great book. It's a fun book. I think everybody's going to really love it. So. And that is, I could almost do it. This is, there. no, nice. here. This is me when I was 19 and playing in rock and roll bands. Oh, wow. Nice. All right. I, see, I didn't realize that was you yeah, on the we, cover there. Well, we, I, it's supposed to be a fictional character. Right, of but course. <laughs> again, it was a free, we got to get a free picture, but it was, <laughs> but that is actually when I was playing in bands and I had hair. Nice. And now did you self-publish this one also? And so does Oh, no, no. This is published by a, a legit New York publisher, a small okay. publisher called Three Rooms Press. Okay. And they are distributed by the biggest indie distributor nice. in, the, okay. in, the, in the world. So okay. in, by Ingram, which is a huge company. So their books get everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's nice. cool. Cool. So. Cool. Well, uh, much, much luck, much success with the book. Um, thank you, Mike. I thank you, Rob, for taking the time today chatting. This is a lot of fun. Like I said, Kiss fans, music fans, you're going to love the book. Go check it out. Uh, you're too, too nice. Well, thank you very much. This, this was fun for me. Awesome. And, thank uh, you. Talk, talk again, I hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Rob. Appreciate it. Take it easy. Ciao. Bye-bye. Okay. All righty. There you have it. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Thanks a lot, Robert, for spending an hour with me talking about your book, Loudmouth, as well as some of the things you've worked on in the past. I had a lot of fun chatting. As we discussed, head on over to his website, Duncan Writes, 
that's Wrights with a W-R-I-T-E-S, and order his book, Loudmouth. I think you guys are going to really enjoy reading it. If you are watching this on YouTube, I included the link directly below for you to go ahead and pre-order it. Go check that out. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.